You are watching a video. Right now, this is a video. You're probably watching on your TV at home, on your computer at the office, or on your phone while sitting on the toilet. While you watch, every second, there are millions of pixels lighting up your screen with high definition images with rich stereo sound, both coded with billions of bits streaming to you through the internet. Mobile devices, smart TVs, and easy access to high-speed internet have made this all seem common, trivial even. But the magic of how these images and sounds are coming to you instantly, just about anywhere, is a pretty incredible feat of engineering. The technology has become so commonplace that the appearance of a buffering symbol, even on mobile internet, is considered a failure of the streaming service. A problem we had to contend with while building our own streaming service, Nebula. And as Windover Productions did before me, in telling the story of why Nebula exists, I'm telling the story of how it exists. Because it's something I helped build, I'm speaking directly to camera for the first time. When we started out, Nebula didn't have any dedicated staff of engineers. It was an experimental side project. So we built the first version on Zype, which offers white label streaming video services. Using their tools, we had a full worldwide service up and running in just a few months. The problem was that Zype wasn't built to handle the complexities of running hundreds of channels, or releasing hundreds of videos per month, or streaming to hundreds of thousands of active subscribers. As Nebula outgrew them, we knew we needed to build something fully custom, from the ground up. A streaming system we named Sterlite. From the software that compresses and delivers the video to servers around the world, to the apps and browsers you watch them on, and the internet in between, this technology has advanced drastically in the last decade. This is how it works. If you were born after the year 2000, streaming video might not seem like a big deal, but in the early internet days of the 1990s, streaming a video was basically unthinkable. In 1999, the trailer for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, broke records by being downloaded over 1 million times in 24 hours. Downloaded, not streamed. Because streaming a movie trailer at any level of quality simply wasn't possible for the dial-up modem connection speeds common at the time. In those days, most people connected to the internet using their telephone lines. Incredibly slow internet that was measured in the kilobits per second, not the mega and gigabits we are accustomed to today. Those modems worked through modulation of a digital signal onto an analog sound signal being transferred over the copper telephone wires. If the amplitude of the sound was high, it was a binary one. If the amplitude was low, it was a zero. The transmitting computer would modulate the data into sound waves and the receiving computer would demodulate, modulate, demodulate, modem. To an extent, this is how most physical cables work, short of fiber optics. But doing this over copper telephone wires is prone to loss. So the fastest speed you could possibly hope to get in the best conditions was 56 kilobits per second. For comparison, even a 720p YouTube video has a bitrate of five megabits per second around 90 times faster than a dial-up modem could receive. By 2005, broadband connections like cable modems were much more common, providing the infrastructure for three guys in Northern California to start a video dating service called YouTube. That year, when Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson had their infamous wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl halftime show, the trio realized that they couldn't find any video of the incident online and repurposed YouTube to be a digital video repository that anyone could use. Nearly two decades later, home internet speeds have advanced significantly. But more crucially, mobile internet connections have gotten so fast that they often rival dedicated home connections. The smartphone revolution has driven cellular data speeds to insane new levels, adding more and more frequencies and ways to squeeze more data onto them. We now have the technologies to send that data over long distances quickly, but that's just part one of the problem. When you clicked on this video, you expected it to play immediately, without buffering. That can happen if the video is stored on a server near you, and you are one of the privileged people to have access to fast internet. But that isn't always the case, and solving those edge cases is where the smaller indie streamers like Nebula need to play smart. The primary constraint is bandwidth, while high-speed connections are common in the Western world, not all users will have fast internet access. And even if they do, problems can still occur, which may lead to degraded performance. 
A poorly shielded microwave can interfere with Wi-Fi. Internet service providers may have temporary slowdowns during times of peak usage, and going through a subway tunnel on your morning commute may cause you to intermittently lose signal. To help combat these inconsistencies, the server will encode the video several times with different bit rates. Bit rate simply means the speed at which the video will need to be transmitted in order to avoid buffering or pauses. Once the transcoder limits the bit rate, it will also need to lower the resolution of the video to keep the overall visual quality of the video watchable. Low bit rates combined with high resolution result in blocky video that is very distracting. The transcoder creates files with different bit rates and resolution pairings, producing lower quality smaller files all the way through larger 4K files. When a video player is streaming a video, it isn't downloading the entire file at once. It downloads chunks at a time. This allows for changes in streaming quality during playback. If your internet connection slows down, the service can switch to the lower resolution version of the file on the fly. The video may not look as good, but it will keep playing and hopefully switch back later when the connection improves. It also allows for starting playback in the middle of the video. If you want to pick up a video where you left off yesterday, there's no need to download the entire file. Plus, since most videos don't get watched to 100% completion, this approach also saves countless dollars on bandwidth bills. For Nebula's Starlight system, the team uses fragmented MP4s for this packaging. This lets us separate the audio files from the video. Audio requires much smaller file sizes compared to video, and studies have shown that poor audio quality will impact the viewer's experience more than poor video quality. In other words, a bad sounding video will look worse. By separating audio and video, the team ensures the audio quality remains the same between all resolutions. Once the files are split, Text manifests are written to describe the precise timing and file location for every chunk of video. These manifests are what the video player reads when they load a video. Once the central servers have finished processing the new files, it needs to store them across multiple different servers to ensure there is a copy near the viewer. There is a popular misconception that storage and bandwidth are the expensive parts of running a streaming service. While file storage was once very expensive, Modern services like Amazon Web Services S3 and Backblaze B2 provide pretty inexpensive storage. Around 3.7 million new videos are uploaded to YouTube every day, so we imagine their storage cost is higher than ours, but they also own all of their data centers. We think it's safe to say that YouTube probably pays less per video for storage than Nebula does. But for context, Nebula's entire catalog is currently around 30 terabytes, we pay less than $200 per month to store it. That's less than I pay for my production team's Adobe subscriptions. With the files transcoded, packaged and stored, the next step is to deliver them to viewers. When a user requests to watch a video, the service could serve it to them directly from storage, but depending on where in the world the viewer lives, that might be a slower process. This is why we need a CDN. A CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. This is a network of servers all over the world spaced out specifically to ensure that there's a server near any given video viewer. When you tap to watch a video, the service matches you to the CDN server closest to you and starts the stream. The previous steps were all just preparation to ensure that this local server had what it needed. CDNs have the capacity to transfer the 2000 terabytes of video data that Nebula delivers every month. The CDN Nebula uses, Fastly, uses a two-step caching system utilizing three sets of servers. First, there's the local servers, called nodes. These are ideally located very close to you. When your app or browser requests a video, the service first checks for the files at your local node. If it doesn't find them, it checks the caching servers. The caching servers act as a second layer of temporary storage. They contain all of Nebula's catalog videos, allowing them to serve nodes in their region quickly. Finally, there's the origin, the data center with the servers and hard drives containing all of the original transcoded videos. Duplicating every video file on every node around the world would take up a lot of space and use a lot of bandwidth. So the system prioritizes newer high demand videos. If a video is especially popular, 
there's a good chance that someone in your geographical region has beaten you to watching it first. If the video is older and less popular, the chances that it has that initial buffering time is higher. It's a lot like how a retail supply chain works. Items are produced at the factory, the origin, shipped to a warehouse, the caching servers, and then distributed to local stores, the nodes, for quick, convenient access. If you experience stuttering or lag or general poor video performance, this is often the root cause. The video files are being served to the CDN nodes on demand. If you're using a service with millions or billions of users, you'll likely never be the first person to want to watch a particular video. For a smaller service like Nebula, if you live in an area where there aren't many subscribers, you're more likely to end up waiting for that first transfer more often. As Nebula grows, this becomes, counterintuitively, less of a problem. Nebula is growing incredibly quickly, and we've more than doubled our direct subscribers in 2023. I mentioned earlier that there's a misconception about storage and bandwidth being the expensive parts. We could only guess what someone like YouTube pays for bandwidth and delivery for their videos. But for comparison, as of September 2023, Nebula currently has around 300,000 active monthly users and spends less than $20,000 per month on bandwidth to serve them all. The biggest hard cost for a streaming service is hiring talented engineers. Building this complex system requires front-end and back-end web engineers to create the API and build a website, development operations people to make sure the systems are all healthy and running correctly, quality assurance people to help find bugs in the code before it ships, and countless product designers and app developers to bring the experience to all of the devices you want to watch the videos on. To get a video playing on your screen, you need an app with a video player. Sometimes this happens in a web browser, and sometimes it happens in a dedicated app. For most internet-enabled systems, there's a client and a server. The client is the program making the requests, and the server is the system that answers those requests. Most modern software is written, so the majority of the logic and processing happens on the server side, not the client. This helps to simplify development across devices. If there are going to be any major show-stopping software bugs, it's better to have them happen on the server, where the engineers and development operations teams can quickly roll out fixes without needing to go through an app approval process or release new updates. For a video service, the server sends a list of videos and all of the thumbnails to go with it. And the client app renders those into some kind of human-readable list for you to browse through. There are different kinds of apps, web apps, mobile apps, desktop apps, TV apps. Different devices will often require that apps be written in completely separate programming languages, like Swift for iOS, Kotlin for Android, or JavaScript and TypeScript for smart TVs, and even incredibly niche languages like BrightScript for Roku, which makes hiring even more difficult. To confuse matters further, Many of these devices will require that apps be distributed through proprietary app stores with their own approval processes. When Nebula launched on LG Smart TV app earlier this year, it took months to get approved on the store. And quick update, while we were working on this video, LG told us that Nebula's LGBTQ content was a violation of their content policy, and the app needed to be removed in 46 countries. We asked for clarity on this policy, but we were only told that it was for religious and cultural elements in those countries. We're not really sure why they didn't just remove it themselves, and they haven't responded to our requests for further discussion. Regardless of the outcome, having these conversations and jumping through these hoops consumes a lot of resources and is generally just a pain in the ass. This is just one of the many apps we had to develop. Getting approval for iPhone updates, however, typically happens in a matter of hours. Catering to each user's watching habits was an expensive startup cost in development. While Nebula has only recently started tracking watch time by device, nearly half of all YouTube views happen on TV screens. If any streaming service wants to hold your attention, it needs to be available no matter how you want to watch. And that means supporting a wide variety of options. Native mobile apps enable you to download videos to watch offline in case you're on a long flight without Wi-Fi. TV apps make for comfortable watching in your living room, 
Web apps mean access from any device with a web browser, which can have some surprising results. Nebula even has a small number of viewers who watch from their web browser in their Teslas. It can be tricky to account for all of these variables in this equation. Different devices running different operating systems, running apps written in different languages, with different screen sizes and design requirements, communicating over connections that could range from high-speed fiber optics to a spotty cellular signal in an airport bathroom. When you open your phone to watch a video, what you're really launching is a massively complex system that depends on a team of incredibly skilled software engineers and designers who not only make all of this possible across all these scenarios, but make it look easy. Nebula is built as a partnership between the platform and the creators. The company provides the business structure, design and engineering that make up the platform, and the creators bring their videos and creative vision. The platform will never be complete, that's the nature of software, but this partnership has already led to a stable ecosystem. Nebula has hundreds of thousands of subscribers and the number two subscriber retention stats of any streaming service, second only to Netflix. This retention is possible because our audience really cares about our creators and believes in what we're building. We respond by making increasingly better videos for them to watch, which gives them a reason to stay. It's a virtuous cycle. It's a very different kind of audience relationship and we want to safeguard that relationship and ensure Nebula stays true to the people who supported it from day one. That's difficult to do when you take investment from venture capital firms. We don't want to do that and that limits us in some ways. For a subscription business, the key is to find a balance between cash and revenue. Cash is money you have today. Revenue is money that comes in over time. If we were a VC-funded startup, we'd have a bunch of cash and we'd spend it on things we hope would bring in money later, like funding originals. But we aren't VC-backed, we are fan-supported. So instead of sacrificing the platform's autonomy to shadowy figures in Silicon Valley, we turned to our most loyal subscribers. The truth is, we have 680,000 customers. We can see from our retention stats that many of them have no intention to cancel their subscription. So why not offer them a way to purchase a lifetime subscription? If every single one of those subscribers purchased a lifetime subscription for say $300, we would have $204 million in the bank to fund the projects they signed up to watch. So that's what we did. And it has allowed us to raise capital without turning to venture capital firms. You can buy a lifetime subscription right now. That program has been incredibly successful for us. It turns out a lot of people don't like having reoccurring subscriptions every month and would prefer to just pay once upfront for lifetime access. And we've used that funding to greenlight a lot of really exciting projects, including some from our team that we can't yet announce. That's unheard of for a streaming platform. It's blurring the lines between Hollywood and creator owned businesses. We've even greenlit entire movies that our creators have written, like Patrick Willems and Abigail Thorne. That's ultimately our goal, to give creators opportunities that they traditionally can't get, because some guy in LA won't even let them in the room. This is where the line between educational video and ad becomes blurry, so I'm going to demarcate it. This channel depends on funding Nebula provides us. If you've been subscribed to this channel for more than three years, You've seen the huge increases in production quality that Nebula has facilitated. We first started using 3D animations in the logistics of D-Day Nebula original series. Those were all done within After Effects, which is extremely limited in 3D animation. Then we upgraded to Blender and Cinema 4D, thanks to increased revenue driven by Nebula sponsorships. Now I think it's fair to say that we are a world-class engineering animation studio, just look at our recent Space Shuttle series for proof of that. We are committed to continuing that trend, investing more and more into our production quality, because I won't be happy until we are the best engineering film studio on the internet. So please consider signing up for Nebula, or even better, switching to a lifetime membership. Of course, the regular monthly and yearly options are still available too. You can sign up to a monthly, yearly, or a lifetime membership with the link in the description or sign up by pressing the button on screen right now.